Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Amea, and I am a backend engineer at Typeform, and based here in Barcelona. So today, I'm going to talk about a project that we worked on recently at Typeform, which is about versioning our public APIs. So before I get started, I'll just let you know a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from New York, and I just moved to Barcelona about three months ago to start working at Typeform. Uh, previous to working at Typeform, I was working at Square, a financial services company based in San Francisco, but I was working in the New York office, and similar to our last speaker, I was not working on anything related to APIs, um, mostly um, consumer lending services, so I was working internally on a Ruby on Rails application, never touching any public APIs at all. But when I started at Typeform about three months ago, there was a company-wide initiative related to API versioning that I thought was interested, so I got involved with the project. Um, today, in my talk, I'll go through basically the framework that we use to consider the process of API versioning at Typeform. And before I do that, I'm just quickly give you some background about Typeform in case anyone hasn't heard of it. Um, Typeform is a form building software. And the purpose of Typeform is to allow um, companies and people to connect better with their users. So one of our mottos is basically make every interaction count. And so we want the form creators and the form responders to have an easy time interacting with the Typeform. So similarly, this idea can extend to our consumers of our public APIs. So basically, we want to make the process as easy for them to start integrating and to stay integrated with our APIs, hopefully with as little trouble as possible. So throughout this talk, I want at the end, I want you to be able to answer the following three questions. The first is, what is API versioning? How is it helpful? And then, what are some strategies on how to approach API versioning? So hopefully, if this is something you're considering doing, at your organization, you can follow a similar framework that we use at Typeform. So to start from the basics, hopefully we all know this um, since the conference is called API Days, but an API is an application programming interface. And this is an example of the public APIs exposed by Typeform. So one specific endpoint is called Create Form. I'll be using this as an example throughout my presentation. So if you look here, you can see that there are a variety of fields in the request. So let's say we publish this API. Um, we have a few people integrate. It's really great. And three months later, we decide that we want to change something. So let's say we wanted to add in a field called background image into the request. So if we add in this field as optional, this is actually OK. Without any versioning, basically all of the users that are already integrated with the endpoint won't know that anything has changed. And then any new users that go to the documentation after a specific point can see that there is now an optional field called background image and they can decide whether they want to um, pass it in or not. But if we decided after our three months that we actually want this background image field to be required, without any type of API versioning, we can't actually just introduce that change without any sort of communication or anything, because everybody who is already integrated with the endpoint would have their integration broken. Um, similarly, if we decided that we wanted to delete one of the fields from the request, anybody who had already been passing in that field would have their integration broken. So as I mentioned, at Typeform, we want to make the process very easy for all of our customers. And some of these customers are consumers of our APIs. So, it's really, really not a great practice to introduce breaking changes without having any API versioning. So the concept of API versioning is pretty simple. It's basically maintaining different versions of the same resource. So you could have one um, version of the create form endpoint that actually took in the background image as required, and you could have another version that didn't. So basically, people would integrate with the latest version um, that was available when they decided to integrate, and then you could introduce new changes later on. And since they're, they're touching completely different versions of the same code, they wouldn't have any uh, of their code break. So now we've answered the first question from the goals. The next question is, so why is API versioning helpful? So um, I realize there's a typo. It should say helpful, not helping. Um, but so the main idea is to allow forward progress and iteration on public APIs that you already have exposed. So it's a little unreasonable to expect that the first time that you create an API, you know exactly what you're going to want it to look like and evolve for over the next years. 
So these are live things that will constantly be changing, hopefully after learning how people are using them and maybe introducing new features. So allowing forward progress in a way that doesn't break current users. So with API versioning, you can introduce breaking changes, um, again, without breaking current users. And then the last thing is, once you have different versions of, of APIs, you can start to deprecate old endpoints. Because you can start to say, you know, after, um, let's say, three versions, after, if you're three versions behind the latest, we'll start to delete endpoints. And you have a way to basically maintain whichever one is the latest, and there's a different way of numbering and naming the versions of the endpoint. So before I go on, I just wanted to quickly define what we consider as breaking changes at Typeform. Um, I won't read through all of these, but these are basically some of the examples that I thought through earlier. Cool, so now we've discussed the basic ideas of what API versioning is and when it can be helpful. So the last, um, the most meaty part of the talk is how do I approach API versioning? So I'll go through a series of steps. The first is to figure out what level would you like to version at. If I go back to this public web page from Typeform, basically you see there's different groups of APIs here, and in each API there's a, there's a set of endpoints. So you could take the complete um, one extreme approach, which is versioning all of the endpoints together. This would be something like saying there's a Typeform v2 and API. So if you're integrated with any endpoint in Typeform, you would have to pass in the same version for all of the integrations that you have. The complete opposite approach would be to version each endpoint separately. Um, so you could say if you're using create form, but then you're using a different one to get the results from a form, you can pass in the different versions. And then the last kind of middle option is to version each group of endpoints. So if you think about it, there's pros and cons to each of these. Versioning all the endpoints together is easier for the users just because they don't have to remember different versions that they're integrated with different endpoints. Um, but it has the downside that maybe people do actually want a different level of granularity with different endpoints that they're integrated with. Kind of the exact opposite for versioning each endpoint separately. If you've integrated it with 35 different endpoints from Typeform, you really, really don't want to have the user have to remember all of the different versions that they have. But this does allow kind of a finer grain comb um, of granularity. So um, what we had talked about at Typeform was to be able to version each group of endpoints. So as you can see, we kind of already have these four different groups of endpoints. And it would make sense that if you're interacting with responses, for example, you would want all of the code that you have related to responses to be on the same version. So the next step is to figure out, figure out a strategy for versioning. The two that I'll be talking about today are semantic versioning and calendar versioning. So semantic versioning, you've probably seen if you've um, been writing code for a little bit. It's pretty popular. And so the format is there's a major dot minor dot patch. So you'd increment a major version if you have any breaking changes increment a minor when you're adding a new non-breaking functionality, and then you would increment a patch if you're only adding bug fixes. So for example, this would be adding a new functionality, this would be um, breaking changes, and this would be bug fixes. So the pros of this is that it's pretty standard. Most of us have seen um, code that uses semantic versioning before. And the users can choose when to upgrade. Um, I mean this kind of like you know what to expect if you're upgrading a breaking versus upgrading um, increasing functionality. You kind of know what the magnitude of changes are. But one of the big cons is since we only um, upgrade the major versions when there are breaking changes, a lot of people think that you kind of have to wait until there's enough changes to justify creating a new major, which can mean that it can be really painful to upgrade, um, and it's not really incentivized for users to upgrade. For example, one of the projects I was working on at Square, um, I was in charge of upgrading our version of Rails, and that was basically took about three months, a group of three engineers, just to fix all of the breaking changes that were introduced in that version. So it was a pain in the ass, and you don't want to have to think about that, especially for the um, programming framework that you're using. It should kind of be a sort of simple thing since it's a very basic part of our code. 
So an alternative to semantic versioning is called calendar versioning. So the main thing that critics of semantic versioning have is that they think that the version names don't have any intrinsic meaning. So you can see here, this is um, some example of build names that we use at Microsoft. Um, basically, the first one is obviously a date, and so the first one would be the first build released on that day, and then the second one would be the second build released on that day. Ubuntu also uses a similar concept, so they use a stripped version of the year and then um, the month that it was released. So some pros of this is that the, now the version numbers actually have meaning. Um, and maybe it might be easier for you to remember more or less when you integrated with an API. And so you can know, you know if there's roughly two months between the endpoints, it's not going to be as many changes as between three years, for example. But one of the cons is that it's kind of not clear what the magnitude of changes between the versions will be, since semantic versioning has that um, already concept of you only increment the major if there are breaking changes. I don't know if there's changes between July and August, were there any breaking changes, were there bug fixes, it's really hard to say just by looking at the name of the version. So Stripe is a pretty popular example of using calendar versioning. Um, as you can see here, they basically just use the exact date of the releases. Um, but one of the nice things that they do is that they only create a new release when there are breaking changes. But as you can see, the uh, changes are small and they're kind of encapsulated. So it's easy to understand the version names, but then also they have small changes. So they're not waiting two years to release a new version of Rails, for example. Um, they'll in introduce one or two breaking changes in each um, version. Now, one of the cons for the engineers at Stripe is that that means that they have to maintain that many more versions, which I wanted to touch on as a downside of API versioning. So I really like this quote from the Stripe blog. It basically means the easier that you make it for your developers, the harder it is for the engineers at your organization to be maintaining different versions of the same code. If you think about Stripe, they actually maintain all of the versions since the beginning of time. This can be over 100 versions of the same code. And figuring out how to resolve that internally is actually pretty tricky, which is what I will start talking about right now. So the first part about the internal implementation of API versioning is how does the user tell you which version they would like to call? Surprisingly, this is actually, there's a lot of conversation about this, so I'll go through some, um, some specific um, options. And I just wanted to mention that I'm specifically going to be talking about REST endpoints for this part of the talk, but the concepts are applicable um, to other kinds of endpoints as well. So the first option would be to add a version to the URL. So you can see in here there is a V2 in the URL. Um, this is kind of an easy place to put the version. But a lot of people have problems with this because they say that the URL is actually supposed to describe the resource or entity that you are modifying or accessing. So if you think about it, some people would say that v2 is not actually a different resource than the v1 of create form. So another option could be to create a custom request header. As you can see here, there's a custom, requ re custom request header called API version. And then you can specify basically whatever you want in there. Now, critics of this approach would say, well, if you're going to use a custom request header, why don't you just use an HTTP accept header, since that's what they're for. So this is an option of the implementation. Sorry, I see. I guess you can't really see from over there. Um, and then the last option would be to put in the query parameter, which is kind of similar to the first. Um, version, but basically instead of actually modifying the resource name, you just pass it in at the end of the URL. So one approach that actually avoids all of these is just to auto-pin the user to a version when they integrate with your API. So this is a kind of fancy approach because it requires you to store the user settings, but basically if you grab user information upon their first integration, you can say, now I know that, for example, this person is has integrated with version two, and they don't have to ever pass in what version they want. I'll remember that whatever request they have, you add in an extra layer that will just populate it with the, the version. Um, this is a benefit because it's easier for the user, um, but then maybe they'll never actually upgrade because they don't even know what version they're integrated at. 
So after you decide basically what level you want to version at, what your versioning strategy is, and how your users are going to tell you what version they'd like to request, you have to get to the really tough part, which is how do you resolve the versions internally? Basically, once you get a request, oops, <laughs> once you get a request um, and you know that somebody wants to access the V2 of the Create Form API, how do you make sure that actually calls the right code? So a really popular approach for this is to create a transform from new versions to old. Um, so for example, if we have the Create Form API, and let's say this is a simplified version that only takes in a name and a number of fields. So if someone were to pass in um, a call like this, we would just you know, send it along as usual. But now, let's say we wanted to get rid of number of fields. So we have a second version of create form that now only takes in a name. Obviously, this request would break because the signatures don't match up. So what we could do is we could create a shim layer on top of the new create form. So basically, people who were calling the old create form, if they wanted to call um, the v1, which actually took in the number of fields, they could just call that and return. But then the v2, we could pass it along through to the second version of create form, and then that would work. So as you can imagine, creating a shim layer for every single endpoint that you have can be a burden, especially if you have a lot of endpoints. So I was, we were discussing at Typeform about how to delegate to external tools. Um, we use Istio for um, our service mesh internally, and so we were talking about whether it's possible to pass in um, versions of APIs with the, the headers to the internal requests in Istio. Again, this is kind of not, this is not a tool that was built for API versioning, and so when we talked to the people um, on our ops teams, they were talking about how we would basically be mangling a tool that was meant to do something else to solve the problem that we had. And one of the big negatives was that this would require us to have entirely deployed versions of our apps for each different version of an endpoint that we would want. So this created a lot of additional overhead and we decided that was not the right approach. Um, some people had also considered using GraphQL. Um, again, when we talked to people, this is not a tool that is designed to solve the problem of API versioning. And so we didn't want to become reliant on a tool um, that would actually probably end up causing more problems for us at the end. So the last thing that I'll talk about here is how to deprecate old versions of an API. So I mentioned this as one of the benefits of API versioning is that you don't have to be tied to the original version of the code that you wrote. Um, so the first thing that I think is really important is to come up with a deprecation plan before you even start introducing the versions. Um, this can be something like saying, you know, after a version has new version has been released for six months, we'll start deleting the oldest versions. Or maybe no deprecation plan is a valid deprecation plan. You'll say, I decide that I'm going to maintain all of the endpoints forever. But communicating this to your users is important so that they know when they integrate with your endpoint kind of what they're signing up for. An important part of this is to create communication channels with your consumers. So if you don't have the email address or any way to contact the people who integrate with your API, it's really hard to tell them, for example, that you're going to be deprecating an endpoint that they're currently consuming. Um, and this kind of seems really simple, but if you've had public endpoints for a while, maybe the first thing you were thinking of was not to, to get um, contact information from your consumers, and now you're kind of tied where you know who the people, like the IPs that are consuming from specific endpoints, but you have no way to tell them that you don't want them to consume from them anymore. And related to that, um, it's important to actually incentivize users to upgrade to new versions. This is kind of two-sided. So if you're creating new versions of your code and there are actually no people who want to upgrade the version, that's probably a sign that the changes that you're introducing are not actually worthwhile enough for them to take the time to upgrade. Um, similarly, a way to incentivize your users to actually take the time would be to introduce breaking changes paired with new functionality that the users might want. So the reason that I actually spent three months trying to upgrade the Rails version of this monolith app was because there was new functionality that we decided was worth it. So we went through all the pain um, of upgrading and then we got benefits from that. So similarly, if you're only upgrading things that the users think are not worth it, you're just gonna have to maintain old versions of the API forever, which as I mentioned, is a lot more work for the engineers at your organization. <laughs> 
So that was a lot of content. Um, in conclusion, I wanted to go through the three questions that we had talked about at the beginning and talk about the answers now. So we now know that API versioning is a way to maintain different versions of the same resource. It's helpful because it allows you to progress and introduce breaking changes in an already live endpoint. And in terms of how to approach it, um, you can choose to use semantic versus date-based or calendar versioning. You can add the version in the URL, the header, the query parameter, or auto-pin your users to specific versions. You can resolve the version internally using shim layers or trying to find some external tool that works for your use case. And then you come up with a deprecation plan from the beginning, making sure you have communication channels with your users. So after all of this, we had a group of about five people across different teams at Typeform discussing all of these options. And after a few months of discussion, we decided actually not to implement API versioning right now. And the <laughs> The reason that we did that was we went through all of these options and we realized there's actually a ton of work to do. And unless we had um, future ideas for breaking changes or for deprecating old versions of the code, it was not really worthwhile, especially at a startup with so few people, to use resources to work on building this framework. This doesn't mean that we'll never do it. Um, I can imagine in the future if we want to change one of our endpoints significantly, we can start the process, but it wasn't worthwhile for us right now. So that's the end of my talk. I wanted to say thank you to everyone for being here. And if you're interested in working on cool problems like this, you can come talk to Typeform at the booth that we have, or feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you. Thank you, Omeya, for the interesting talk. Any questions from the crowd? Yeah, we got three. I'll get to the close. Uh, thank you, Amir, for the talk. Um, you didn't touch uh, during it on, like, you did touch on how to approach the versioning and how to code for that versioning and how to distinguish it through that version. You didn't touch on the documentation, like how you would document each version, how to keep that uh, documentation organized. Have you have your team uh, done any research on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that was one of the things that we discussed throughout the process um, that didn't end up making it to the talk. But basically what we were going to do is use API docs. So basically make sure that the endpoints internally were commented and had everything listed out and then pull directly from the actual code endpoints and have different pages served for different versions of the documentation. And this way, since it's not, it's part of the code process, that way you don't have to separately remember to go and create a new version, a uh, new documentation um, and everything. So we actually have um, technical writers that were going to be helping us with kind of summarizing the differences between versions, doing all the communication, work on the documentation as well. Um, but since we didn't, we decided that we weren't going to do it, we didn't really get to the point of fleshing that out in a lot of detail. Yep. Although you decide not to implement the API versioning, uh, you were talking about the delegation to external tools. And my question is, if did you find any of them, and what does these tools do for the to manage the API versioning? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one of the reasons that we actually decided not to do it was we couldn't find any tools that specifically fit what we wanted to do. So we'd basically have to build the um, the layer of deciding the versions ourselves, which ended up being a lot of work. Um, I mentioned some of the options that we considered, but we couldn't find anything that we thought was lightweight enough for us to kind of spin it up with a group of, you know, as few people as we had. But if anybody has had success with that, it would be really interesting to hear what you've used and kind of how it works. Hey, thank you for the talk. Um, so have your team researched, uh, or actually do you use Hyper? hypermedia in, in your endpoints, and have you done some research on versioning that? I'm um, sorry, did you say hypermedia? Yes. No, we did not look into that, and I'm actually not sure what that is, so maybe a good chance for us to chat after this. Any more questions? No? <laughs>
and thank you, Amelia, again.